You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Wednesday the 1st of May. An engaging geezer. Rejected candidate for being too white and too Jewish. 34,000 criminals say sorry and are let off by police. Germans see Islam as a threat. Just when Greeks thought it couldn't get worse. Netherlands ends multiculturalism. Tokyo governor sorry over Islam gaffe. Assad against the Western world. Thought for the day, a Muslim for a month. And finally, a dim move. UK News, an engaging geezer. Conservative London Mayor Boris Johnson thinks Nigel Farage is a rather engaging geezer in his criticism of Cabinet Minister Without Portfolio, Kenneth Clark's ill-advised insults targeting UKIP. Clark, in an interview with Sky News, when asked if he agreed with Prime Minister David Cameron's view that of UKIP as a fruitcakes and closet racists, responded, I have met people who satisfy both those descriptions in UKIP. Before going on to say, it's very tempting to vote for a collection of clowns or indignant angry people who promise that somehow they will allow us to take your revenge on people who caused it. Johnson was joined by Conservative backbencher Nadine Doris, who criticised Clark's comments when she tweeted, I suppose Ken Clark's strategy of being rude to and insulting Tories about to vote UKIP means we don't want them back for general election. UKIP leader Nigel Farage hit back, deriding the veteran minister without portfolio as a bloated remnant of an ancient regime, plucking crumbs from his velvet waistcoat and disdaining the people beyond the gates. They are concerned because we have a million youngsters unemployed, we have wages being driven down, and I'm afraid a crime wave in London being caused by Romanians already. There's nothing in UKIP that is racist in any way at all, and Ken Clark knows it. World at eight. Bullshit. In the strongest terms. UKIP claims they are non-racist, well into today's PC crap, that may be true, but they still mention Romanians by name. If the BNP did that, we'd be classed as yet again racist. UKIP are anti-British and anti-European, and I don't mean anti-EU. UKIP don't, after all these years, have a stated immigration policy. They talk of a million youngsters unemployed and have no policy for rebuilding British industry and creating jobs but they claim they will reduce the red tape and strengthen small business. They do, however, have a food, farming and countryside policy that supports GM food, a supermarket ombudsman and a reversal of the fox hunting ban. Rejected candidate for being too white and too Jewish. The Labour Party is embroiled in a race row after a prospective female councillor, Elena Cohen, was allegedly told by Labour councillor Mahmoud Hussein that he would not support her application for an inner city ward because my Muslim members don't want you because you are too Jewish and too white to be considered. Instead, members were presented with one candidate, black South African Hendrida Quinnan, who was selected by an almost unanimous vote. World date states... And who do Labour accuse of being fascists? 34,000 criminals say sorry and are let off by the police. Community resolution allows offenders to avoid criminal record. Increasingly used to tackle violent attacks such as stalking and hate crime, one in eight violent crimes resolved outside court in some areas of the UK. Tens of thousands of violent thugs are escaping a criminal record simply by saying sorry to the victim. Almost 34,000 violent criminals, including some who've carried out knife crimes, sexual assaults and serious assaults, were dealt with using community resolutions last year. They avoid a criminal record because they don't have to go to court, nor do they receive a police caution, which also appears in police records. Last year, 33,673 violent crimes were dealt with under the scheme. That is a 15-fold increase in four years. That total includes 10,160 serious violent attacks, including grievous bodily harm and other assaults in which victims suffered injury. European News. Germans see Islam as a threat. A major study of attitudes towards religion says Germans approve of openness towards other religions, but many are still suspicious of Islam. Former German President Christian Wolff 
earned much praise but also much criticism when said in a speech during his tenure, Islam is also part of Germany. The criticism can be partly explained by the Religion Monitor, a survey put together for the Bertelsmann Foundation. The findings have been published and among them is the fact that half of all Germans believe that Islam does not fit into the Western world. They saw most religions as an enrichment, especially Christianity, also Judaism and Buddhism, but a majority of 51% saw Islam as a threat. But it's not just in Germany. In many Western states, Islam is seen as a particular threat. That applies to 76% of Israelis, 60% of Spaniards, 50% of the Swiss and 42% of US citizens. All the same, there are differences amongst Western European countries. France, Britain and the Netherlands all see Islam in a more positive light than does Germany. Just when the Greeks thought it couldn't get worse. The Greek Parliament passed a bill on Sunday which will see up to 15,500 public sector workers laid off by 2015. The job cuts are among conditions set by the EU and IMF in return for the 8.8 .8 billion euros in emergency loans. The bill, which passed in 168 to a 123 vote, will allow for the first civil service layoffs in more than a century. About 2,000 civil servants will be laid off by the end of May, with another 2,000 following by the end of the year, and a further 11,500 by the end of 2014, for a total of 15,500. This legislation is the latest wave of Greece's draconian austerity programme. World Date states, this is nothing short of financial blackmail of a small state by larger states. I don't envy the Greek people at all, and other nations should be very wary of the fatherland of the EU. Netherlands ends multiculturalism. The Netherlands makes good on its promise to end multiculturalism. The Dutch government says it will abandon the long-standing model of multiculturalism that has encouraged Muslim immigrants to create a parallel separatist society within the Netherlands. The Netherlands, where 6% of the population is Muslim, is scrapping multiculturalism and most of the taxpayer-funded benefits to immigrants in greats that it demands. A new integration bill, which Dutch Interior Minister Piet Heindonne presented to Parliament on June the 16th, reads... The government shares the social dissatisfaction over the multicultural society model and plans to shift priority to the values of the Dutch people. In the new integration system, the values of the Dutch society play a central role. With this change, the government steps away from the model of a multicultural society. The letter continues, A more obligatory integration is justified because the government also demands that from its own citizens. It's necessary because otherwise the society gradually grows apart and eventually no one feels at home anymore in the Netherlands. The new integration policy will place more demands on immigrants. For example, immigrants will be required to learn the Dutch language and the government will take a tougher approach to immigrants who ignore Dutch values or disobey Dutch laws. The government will also stop offering special subsidies for Muslim immigrants because, according to Donna, it's not the government's job to integrate immigrants. The government will introduce new legislation that outlaws forced marriages and will also impose tougher measures against Muslim immigrants who lower their chances of employment by the way they dress. World Date comments, this sentiment is good, but for Holland it's too late. They've shut the stable door long after the horse has bolted. There are enough Muslims already in there and breeding to ignore whatever laws the Dutch bring in. There will have to be stronger measures taken if they want to preserve what way of life the Christian Dutch have left. World News. Tokyo Governor sorry over Islam Gaff. The Governor of Tokyo apologised to the Muslim world Tuesday after saying Islamic countries have nothing in common but Allah and fighting with each other. Naoki Inosi, whose city is bidding for the 2020 Olympic Games, was forced into the climb down after telling the New York Times that Islamic nations are belligerent and overly hierarchical. The comments were seen as a slight on bidding rival Istanbul, which is vying to become the first city from the Muslim world to host the Games. But on Tuesday, a chastened Inosi appeared before television cameras to say sorry. There were remarks that can lead to misunderstandings among Islamic people, he told reporters. So now I clearly apologise. If there are remarks that can be misunderstood, it is the inadequacy of my expression. I said people are fighting in some Islamic countries, but I think it was inappropriate. I want to correct it. Inosi's comments come as Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe 
is set to arrive in Saudi Arabia on the first stop of a swing through the Middle East that will also include Turkey. Tokyo's bid office had already moved to neutralise the impact of the gaffe amid fears it may fall foul of International Olympic Committee rules prohibiting criticism of other bid cities. Tokyo 2020 fully respects and adheres to the IOC guidelines for the candidate cities. Unlike many other developed countries, largely mono-ethnic Japan does not have a significant Muslim population and there is little emphasis in the educational curriculum on cultural sensitivity. World Date says, Cultural sensitivity might be hind. Islam knows nothing of and has no respect for the sensitivities of other cultures. Now even the Japanese are being forced to respect Muslim sensitivities. The old saying, bullshit walks and money talks, comes to mind, except that Mayor Inose wasn't talking bullshit in New York, just in Tokyo where money spoke louder than truth. What he said was, in essence, correct. A sad against the Western world. Georges Clemenceau, French Prime Minister during World War I, said, War is too important to be left to the generals. Chief of the British Defence Staff, General Sir David Richards, who is standing down in July, told senior military officials that any move against Syria under the pretext of chemical weapons use by the government forces would have to be carried out on a huge scale, which is not advisable, the Sunday Times reported. The general also argued that imposing a no-fly zone like the one in Bosnia in 1993 would not be effective because of Syria's air defences. Even to set up a humanitarian safe area would be a, a major military operation without the cooperation of the Syrians. In Syria, we have to be prepared to go to war, he warned. Richards also said that Cameron needs to be extremely cautious and decide whether it's sensible to intervene in Syria, even if its government forces did use chemical attacks on anti-government militants. His warning follows Cameron's comments on Friday that raised fears of another Iraq-style scenario in Syria. While confirming they do not have adequate evidence that shows Syrian government forces used chemical weapons against terrorists, Cameron accused Damascus of using such weapons and of war crimes. US officials declared on Thursday that the Syrian government probably had used chemical weapons twice in March, newly provocative acts in the civil war that has killed more than 70,000 people and displaced hundreds of thousands more. Last week Tuesday, top IDF analyst Brigadier General I.T. Brun told an audience at the security conference in Tel Aviv that the army was quite certain that President Bashar al-Assad deployed chemical weapons against rebel forces in Syria on March the 19th. World Date asks, Are you frightened yet? If not, just go to this report on Radio Britain Online and read the highlights of just one of the day's news reports from a Google alert on Syria. If you're not frightened yet, you should be. This is one Muslim pie we should keep our fingers out of, except maybe to give Assad the same help we're giving these democratic rebels who are killing their own people. Thought for the day, Muslim for the month. Well, you might say I have a bee in my bonnet over Muslims or Islam. Well, I don't. But I am surprised to learn that our establishment, government and other governing authorities, and of course the ever lax and disloyal media, do seem to have a problem with the peoples of this particular faith, and I use that word loosely. The problem they have with them is the direct opposite to the feelings I, and many other people, who are not always nationalistically minded, and that is distrust and wariness. It isn't fear of the unknown, as Muslims and liberals would like to think, but a direct knowledge of exactly how the majority of them do feel, think and act. Now, having gained access to the reading material in Lower Bogland, as I shall call it, Refer Monday, I came across another Brahma for my listeners, who I know are busy electioneering prior to the big day tomorrow. Under the heading of A Life Less Ordinary and The Faith Dealer, we have Ben Bowler, who has jumped very cleverly into the lovey and multi-faith mould, out of which he gains lots of friends, contacts, holidays and money. And of course, a write-up in the digest. What a clever fellow. He's from Down Under, which could account for his reverse thinking. Did I say that? Oh, naughty, naughty me. For all our listeners in the Antipodes, sorry, mate. He is a charismatic Irish-Australian entrepreneur, raised a Catholic, and has created a unique series of spiritual travel programmes. Monk for a month and Muslim for a month, amongst others. These are now heralded as trailblazers for a new kind of tourism, I'll say. Now, the Monk of the Month ran into trouble with the Thai authorities, who are usually against anyone other than Thais making money out of Thailand. 
in 2010, when the authorities, whose palms had not been greased enough, said that he was profiteering from an experience the Thais undertook for free. But they have resumed again. To come is to be a Sikh for a month in the Punjab. Oh dear, try mixing that with being a Muslim for a month and you'll have partition all over again. Tibetan Buddhism is running the gamut as well. Just launch your unfortunate customers into Tibet and let them run the gauntlet of Chinese troops and colonisers out there, matey, for a true experience of Tibetan life. He had an epiphany at Ayers Rock in 2006, and whilst his wife, Jildu, and he were teaching in northern Thailand, they had another, namely, wouldn't it be fun to bring in foreigners to live in a temple too? Yup, fun and profitable, and an open market to lost souls who are desperately seeking the truth. Now, for free and on World at Eight, Cronespeak can tell you the truth about seeking the truth. Like a reflection in a mirror, like a rainbow, constantly moving and never obtainable, except maybe at a price too high to pay. There, my own words and problem solved. Now, the one thing the Digest didn't plug was the actual cost of these spiritual journeys to the East. Just the name of the website to go to, worldweavers.com. And in the true ethos of journalism, I went to that site, and I still couldn't find any mention of money, be that donations or travel expenses. Now, call me cynical, but does Ben pay the cost of hauling various religious refugees around the world for weeks on end out of his own pocket? No, of course not. So how much does it actually cost to be a Muslim for a month? No sodding idea, mateys. The mantra for this organisation is, unite, inspire, engage and develop. Now, these titles should be a warning to all nationalists. They reek of the Hope Not Hate Brigade. But words like this, unlike the realistic world of true nationalism, brings in the dollars, as Farage has found out. Always appear to do good and think lovely thoughts, bugger the truth, and you'll get all the kudos and shekels you need. But of course, in the real world, he doesn't have to organise for these people to go to Turkey, but just pop over the borders in England and see Islam at its very best in their own locale. Simples. I've got myself a travelling money bag here. The British National Party could do coach trips to Southall, Bradford and Keithley to see all the sights, smells and sounds of the Middle and Far East. What an opportunity to enrich our members and activists in the ways of Islam and indeed even Hinduism and Sikhism. Now, for more local Hampshire members, there could be a coach trip with Beer Stops Incorporated to parts of Aldershot and Farnborough for an in-depth knowledge of the Nepalese in their own habitat including varying stops along the way at a good mixture of takeaways and restaurants. For those with more exotic tastes, there are large pockets of Somali Africans and more in our small villages and towns locally. I could even include a spiritual stop at one of the local mosques or Islamic centres dotted around most of the towns to immerse ourselves in the culture which has mainly been forced on us and for which we in the UK have had little escape. Of course, this Ben is a shrewd businessman and runs the entire shebang from Thailand, including a school for the Shan people, who are the underdogs of the Thais and have not fared well in the past. Good for him. But why the dedication to peoples not of his tribe? Why doesn't this man have a Christian for a month day? Why not a Catholic or Protestant for a month? Or even a Jewish for a month? Hell, we can have Amish for a month or Plymouth Brethren for a month. I can understand the pull of the East and I'm something of a Buddhist myself, in that I avoid killing even small insects, and between our European consultant and I there is a continuing war, as I am Supreme Commander of the Mole Liberation Army, and he has a mole problem. But that aside, I would still kill to protect myself, my family, or anything else if I had to. No seeking or understanding will erase the basic differences between the races and cultures, and neither should they seek to. King Nimrod tried that once with a very unsuccessful end. Peoples are made to be different, and in that difference lies the success of mankind, not the downfall. Different horses for different courses is my mantra, and in my mantra, my country and land is for peoples mainly of my tribe or tribes, not for the general enrichment of our land to the detriment of other lands. Muslim for a Month began its journey in 2011 and has had more than 300 customers and was soon a hit, in Ben's words. Of course, from Ben's family, the usual idiot speak came out, which Ben has used to his own ends. Namely, will you learn to make bombs? Ben's comment on that is predictable and straight from the diversity course that, I believe, that believe it or not, I undertook many years ago. Rather like computer speak, this is a language which most political figures learn at the breast or the boozer and goes thus. 
Spending time with Muslim families is a powerful way to break down prejudice and to correct distorted perceptions. Guests and hosts alike say that the programme has left them transformed. What more can you say on that one? Of course it's left one transformed, because you're seeing the side of Islam that you want to see and they want you to see. To see pictures of the bescarfed European women doing the Muslim for a month tour in Turkey is sickening and unrealistic. Just as bad as the white supremacists who insist that only the white race is good enough to people the entire world are the religious and race traitors who think the white races are not good enough to be anything more than converts or slave labour in their own countries. Ben or Bowler, as I shall call him, decided to do Muslim for a month after 9-11, owing to the fact that this act of removing over 3,000 innocent souls had led to a vicious circle of ignorance and contempt towards the Muslim faith. Well, it would do, wouldn't it, Bowler? Face facts. Muslims couldn't deny that one, and even without all the excuses they seem to bring out, that act has not exactly shone in the annals of human history. To raise my blood pressure even further, one Terry Goldsmith from Bury Lanx, described as a postman first and a Christian second, has said, The Muslim for a month trip was amazing. We couldn't have been treated any better if we were royalty. I learnt that charity is a pillar of Islam, but that is ignored by the British press. Sharia law isn't about cutting people's hands off, it's about family matters, such as inheritances that need to be settled in court. Another well-meaning female came out with the fact that they'd gone to a henna night for just women, and she then compared these women to our drunken girls, which really is no comparison at all, and she would rather be there than shaking her booty in public. Well, I'm with her there, but then again, I'm of an age when shaking my booty in public would be downright indecent, and not a pretty sight, but also it doesn't make me want to rush off to the local mosque and convert. Bowler may be well-intentioned, but gathering from the fact that all his revelations and lights in his head are highly compatible with the subcultures now brewing in Europe and the US of reaching out and understanding our enemies and winning hearts and minds, it all points to a very well-managed and publicised propaganda money-making machine. I'm not out to down Bowler, as he self-funds a school and obviously works very hard, but his mantra is appealing to a section of society who need to apply liberal thoughts to their own people. I would take a bet that most, if not all, his customers wouldn't break bread with a British National Party member or sympathiser. They'd be too bigoted to even listen to another point of view. These people appear to have open minds, but they haven't. They're just as bad as any person with a closed mind. It's just another end of the spectrum. Although Bowler's customers think they're all-encompassing and compassionate, what they are doing is fueling dangerous fires in promoting that the Muslims, especially, are free thinkers and accommodate other religions or cultures. They don't. So my message to the peoples who spend good money in travelling around Turkey to see how Islam works, you should really go to the Sudan, where Christian churches and Christian natives are regularly killed and tortured, when their young girls are sold into slavery. Go to Dubai, where all the Indian workers live worse than slaves, in order to build the monstrosities there. Go to Egypt, where the cops are living with increasing persecution. Go to Saudi, where little girls are raped in the name of Mohammed. Go view the site of the World Trade Center and tell me Islam is peaceful. Go see the slaves and young girl traffickers in the UK and see true misery. See the immense profits that only profit the Muslims in the drug trade. Go next door if living in Lancashire and see the groomed youngsters who are less than human to your Muslim charmers. Go round your own countries, if European, and really see what's going on under your noses with the recolonization of your country and a changeover of your religion. I have done a tour of an Islamic centre in the UK and they were charming and very polite, but underneath that is a soul of stone, because despite all the brainwashing, and unlike most religions apart from the old style Catholics, they want to convert and get more followers and money for Islam. People are power to Muslims. The more they get, the happier they are. Remember that tomorrow. Islam is like UKIP. All on the surface is happy, clappy and smiley. Underneath there is a dark star waiting to emerge in all its glory, and it will not be to your glory. Also remember that at least in the British National Party, whatever the media say about us, what you see is what you get. We aren't hypocrites or liars, but the truth always hurts, which is why so many politicians and business personas avoid the truth like the plague. The question is, will you? And finally, a dim move 
but by whom? The headings in the mirror boasted that an OAP has a new driveway laid that's blocked by a new lamppost, and that the embarrassed great grand now faces a bill of up to £1,200 to shift the light so relatives can park there. They also glowingly praise Hampshire Council, who said, We will coordinate the work to provide a dropped curve and move the lamp to keep costs to a minimum. Pensioner Kathleen Annals had a driveway laid just days after the council put up a new lamppost outside her home. Widow Kathleen of Andover, Hans, today admitted she blundered. She said, I've done it the wrong way round. I had the drive laid after the lamp went up. I'm happy to foot the bill, but I hope the council can shift it soon. Well, Kathleen, I've got news for you. Hampshire County Council and the police seem to have a down on pensioners. Remember Margaret Walker of the leaflet case? Well, this presenter says that if you look at the pictures of the drive and lamp, you will see that although she had her work done after the lamp was in place, you'll see that perhaps the lamp itself was not placed in the right position in the first place. Although she clearly has no drop curb to allow for a car passing over, most lamps are placed not dead centre of foot access to a property or on that property's boundaries. They are normally placed on the gutter side of the road and usually with a property boundary in view. It was idiots who paved the path and council idiots who put the lamp up. Two wrongs do not a right make and the council are acting as con men in getting her to pay for what is in fact a dual mistake. Talk about great grands and pensioners and you'd think losing your marbles is part of the title. Shame on you, Hampshire Council, and I live within your boundaries as well. And indeed have a picture of a car parked in its rightful place under which the Hans CC had written a slow warning for the school at the top of the road. The CC bods should have placed the slow warning on the opposite side of the road, which has nil parking. Duh. You have been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozar and I wish you all a very good night. Good luck tomorrow to us nationalists and remember our chairman's words. Vote British National Party. If no candidate, mark your vote with British National Party or don't vote at all. Show solidarity.